I want to call the about in person and online to a special night with Judy Lynn Smith to talk about her new book, Township. Judy Lynn Smith is a writer, editor, and teacher. She earned her BA in English and Theater from Kennedy College, her Master's in Education from Florida University, and her MFA in Creative Writing from Ohio State. Her work has appeared in the Kennedy Review and many other literary magazines, and she's currently the manager of literary and writing programs at the Public Library Network in West County. And Lee Martin is the Pulitzer Prize finalist author of The Bright Forever, as well as several other novels, memoirs, and short story collections. He's also an English professor at the Ohio State University. So please welcome Jane Lynn and Lee. Um, thanks so much for that introduction, and thank you all for being out here tonight. I am absolutely thrilled to be able to present um, Jamie Lynn's debut collection of short stories, Township, this beautifully designed book uh, that is for sale across the street at Gramercy Books, and I'm sure you'll all want to get a copy of that. Um, congratulations, Jamie Lynn. Thank you. Thank you for walking on this long path <laughs> with me. You know. um, maybe you should explain what you mean by that. I, I suppose I should. Um, there are a couple of OSU MFA alumni in the room who will be familiar with this or who may be tuning in from elsewhere. But um, Lee was one of my thesis advisors at Ohio State University. And um, so some of these stories came directly out of workshops with him and also with Aaron McGraw, who, as I understand, is dialing in from Tennessee tonight and maybe one of our hybrid guests. Um, so, you know, some of these pieces, I think I wrote as long ago as starting in 2013, like in my second semester at Ohio State. And um, they just evolved over time. And you have been so patient. You have earned a grassy spot in heaven with all of these drafts. <laughs> a grassy, as has Aaron. Well, a grassy spot. That reminds me. <laughs> that reminds me to say that uh, these stories come to us from the land of ramps and hickory nuts and walnut moonshine. I'm so relieved you didn't say weed. <laughs> <laughs> um, and in a moment, I'm gonna invite you to read just a, a, brief, a brief bit from one of the stories uh, in the collection. But before I do, um, I'd like to ask you to, to talk just a little bit um, about Appalachia um, and what it means to you. You know, I, interestingly, Knox County is one of, where I grew up, is one of the northernmost counties in Appalachia. Um, in, in terms of Ohio, you know, it kind of like goes off this way. Um, from there, when you're looking at a map of what is considered to be Appalachia or not. But because of migration patterns for work um, and because, you know, the Great Depression um, caused the largest mass movement of people in United States history, right? Um, then coupled with World War II. Um, you know, my family on both sides, actually my, my mother's family and my father's family um, were from the same area of Southwestern Virginia. And interestingly, I found out that they were actually like 237th cousins or something through this woman named Flossie Ball. Like how great a name is that? <laughs> And, uh, but, you know, in terms of my own experience with Appalachia and being Appalachian, um, I don't think I really understood what that was or that it was even a thing until I was like in college. And um, people talked to me about the way I talked and about what they said was an accent, which I was like, what? Like everybody <laughs> talks like this. <laughs> and um, so, you know, it, like there were certain cultural signifiers that I think I really easily identify now, right? Like the food, the music, the love of the land, whatever, like all of the keynotes sort of. But, but for me personally, um, one of the things that I was actually gonna talk about later is that being Appalachian is not a monolith, right? It's actually like a very diverse area. And one of the most, um, in many ways, like the melting pot <laughs> of the country, right? Excuse me. Um, and, and there are so many writers who are doing great work out of Appalachia who are not um, what you would necessarily call like white working class, right? Like there are a ton, ton of Afro-Latin writers um, 
Korean Appalachian writers. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's a great book out, um, another Appalachia growing up queer in, a, in my mountain home that's fantastic from West Virginia University Press. Um, there's like great, great lists out there from Crystal Wilkinson. Mm -hmm. And I think that, uh, and also from Kendra, I wrote her name down because I wanted to say it right so that you could all be as happy about these readings as I am. Kendra Winchester also has a great list. And, and both of these resources are available through electric literature. Um, but so for me, in some ways, you know, my experience is um, growing up in, you know, relative, like relative rural isolation, right, in a, in a, in a poor family. Um, that nonetheless had great respect for education, for reading, you know, and for books, um, and for for people who had, you know, formal education, if you will, um, has been enriched so much by by reading even more about other people's experiences as Appalachian writers. Mm -hmm. So it's not, you know, I also, those of you know, I also identify pretty strongly. Um, as like a, I don't know, displaced New Yorker. And so it, I kind of sometimes feel like I have a foot in each world. And so if you can be like, you know, um, both willing to have a 20 minute conversation with someone who perhaps dials a wrong number, um, <laughs> then you become best friends with them and also be incredibly impatient in line at the post office, <laughs> then like, you know, that's, I'm your people, right? <laughs> I believe uh, I believe I've encountered both of you in in your work. <laughs> um, this would probably be a great time for you to read just a little bit, uh, if if you would be so so kind to honor us uh, with just a short selection uh, from from the stories. Well, sure. Thanks everybody for being here. It's really a lot of fun to see people and be in person. This is the first in-person reading that I have been able to do. And I didn't realize it until I got to the lectern, um, but I am so excited about this. So um, I'm gonna read tonight from a story called A Line of Four Silver Maples. And um, this story is one of the few that has more kind of like some autobiographical strains in it. And it also came out of Lee's workshop. So I really, I really credit him for encouraging me to find more vulnerability and tenderness in my characters. Um, and I, I just, any, any goodness you see in this story, I credit with his sensitivity and, and advisement. It was really, really helpful. Um, so a line of four silver maples. Word was out in the township that Roby was back living in a trailer in country court. The double wide belonged to the Vances, people who weren't relation to him, but who Roby kept calling family. Paul knew the malleability of that term because Roby was his blood cousin. They were raised up next door to each other with only a line of four silver maples and a broad open expanse of lawn separating their houses. Shout and distance is what Paul's father called it. Only most of the shouting came from Roby's father, Ennis, and most of the shouting was directed at Roby. So Roby was often at Paul's house, nose pressed to the glass of the storm door, asking if anyone could come outside and play. Paul had eight years on Roby and the boy had drifted off his radar when he left for college, moved to Columbus and took a job teaching school. Paul's heartbreak over losing his longtime lover gave him good reason to return home to Laurelton, albeit under the premise of caring for his ailing father. By then, Roby had long since disappeared into construction work around Columbus. He was always changing jobs, getting fired, arguing with the boss, or flitting in and out of doomed ventures in self-employment. He had such bad luck, perennially, perennially left holding the bag by some unsavory partner, winding up in small claims, jail, bankruptcy, or lien. Last Paul heard, Roby was in the middle of his third divorce, ducking his soon-to-be ex because the girl wanted her truck back. That early spring, Paul could smell the heavy perfume of apple and cherry blossoms on the breeze despite cold overcast skies. Stacking bags of mulch to spread in his mother's flower beds, he was so lost in the shadows of his own mind that the first he heard of the vehicle was its radio blasting Charlie Daniels' twangy, undulating, long-haired country boy. Paul looked up to see a truck overshoot the driveway. 
a red Ford work truck with a deer dent on one side. The motor groaned when the driver put her in reverse. Paul noticed the broken slider window, one side tinted glass, the other with half a Harley Davidson sticker peeling off. The truck had no tailgate and its bumper was held up with eight gauge wire. One well-muscled arm hung out the window, thick with ink. Dragons, a mermaid, a melting skull, the Confederate flag next to the evil globe and anchor. Roby. Paul last remembered him as a skinny 12 year old, all knees and elbows and the hungry look of a horny kid hoping for something, anything to let him stick his Peter in it. Now even slouched in the bench seat, Roby's bulk made the truck appear toy-like. Hey cuz, Roby drawled, teeth gleaming, long time no see. Paul smiled and said, come on in cousin, good to have you back home. Paul's mother was fast asleep in her chair with the cat on her lap, Bogsy's enormous paunch warming her legs as they snored in unison. Paul adjusted the blinds to take some of the glare off Helen. Roby strode into the room and sent Bogsy bicycling for feckless paws across her stomach. Roby laughed and caught Bogsy, hefting the poor thing into the air. The old feline arched indignantly. Helen's eyes flitted open. Put my cat down, Helen said, or you'll pick your own willow switch. Roby chuckled and bent to gently drop the cat into the chair. Oh, I wouldn't do nothing to a cat, he said. Bogsy ran for his life. <laughs> How are you, Roby asked, kissing Helen on the cheek. Glad to see you, Roby, Helen lied. She offered him a seat, but did not stand on account of her sore legs. Paul's eyes met his mother's. They chatted obliquely while Roby coughed gently and intermittently into his hand. Roby, Paul sensed that Roby had read his unwelcome straight away. If nothing was offered you, a slice of cornbread and buttermilk, some homemade chocolate cake, a glass of iced tea, you could bet you weren't received. Paul noticed the tightness around his mother's eyes whenever she smiled at Roby. Helen's thinly veiled irritation gave Paul a quiver of guilt. He remembered how it had hurt his father when his mother inked the kids' names on foam cups before each family picnic, her pretty mouth flattened into a straight line. It was as if she thought the misfortune and grit at which Uncle Ennis and Aunt Linda and Cousin Roby lived would somehow backwash into the mouths of her own children. Ennis noticed, and worst of all, Roby noticed. Paul knew that Helen's not-so-faint sense of superiority made Roby seek her approval with even more fervor. She withheld it then and now. You mind if I get myself a glass of ice water? Roby asked. Why, sure, help yourself, Helen said. My legs are awful weak. Cups in the same place, just where you left them. Neither Paul nor Helen took thought of the small cash Helen kept hidden in a coffee can in the cabinet, just upright of the kitchen sink. They heard Roby open the refrigerator and wrestle around. Mind if I make a sandwich out of this ham? Roby asked. Of course not, go ahead, Helen said. Then they heard Roby open the cupboard door, sneeze, and run some water. It would be months before Helen noticed the money was missing. Paul would remember the racket Roby made in his kitchen and blush with shame for suspecting him and shame for being right. Helen leaned in to speak to Paul, pursing her lips and gesturing towards the kitchen with her chin. What's he doing back there? Go look if you're so curious. We don't know his condition. He seems all right. Helen need not remind Paul that Roby had been arrested. Once for a fight with an ex that turned ugly, another time for petty theft of materials from a job site, and then a year of state hospitality in Kentucky for selling cocaine. That was years ago, mom, Paul said. Take care not to cast your pearls before swine, Helen said, and adjusted the pillows in her easy chair. Roby returned a moment later, stuffing a red bandana into his back pocket. You're looking good, auntie, Roby said, sitting down and taking a big sip of water. Well, sugar. Helen murmured, aren't you sweet as ever? Bogsy growled a low rumbling sound from his hiding place beneath the coffee table next to Roby's chair. He reached down and scooped the cat up again, cradling Bogsy to his chest as the cat writhed. Roby scratched Bogsy's ears, chuckling, it sure is good to be home. Thank you. <laughs> That was fantastic, Jamie Lynn. I'm so happy to hear you read that. Um, our plan up here, folks, is to chat for just a little while uh, and then to invite your uh, participation with questions and comments. And I'm assuming we have the option of uh, people uh, having questions via chat and or via Zoom. 
Um, and so I thought I'd start out, Jamie Lynn, um, that, that particular scene that you read really uh, leads nicely to this, this mm. question. Um, it, it seems to me from, from my own experience with small towns and rural settings, um, that there's a, a certain code of masculinity um, that sometimes leads to um, people making poor choices, uh, doing things they probably shouldn't do, um, causing troubles within families uh, and those sorts of things. And I'm always interested um, as a writer in the connection between a, a place and a culture and the actions that, that, that come from people who live within that place and that culture. I just wondered if you had some thoughts um, about the male characters in Township um, and how um, perhaps uh, their own setting and their own culture and their own code um, is uh, leading to some, some poor choices on their parts. You know, I think that without poor choices, I wouldn't have much of a book, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and there would certainly be a lot less to do in rural areas. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's, let's be honest, like there are poor choices that can be kind of fun, right? And there are poor choices, that, but like, like, let's see what happens if we set this thing on fire or, you know, but there are also poor choices that like, can be, um, as you said, you know, like destructive and have sort of generational echoes. And I think a lot about the way that what we expect of people is always changing, right? Like what was expected of women 20 years ago, 40 years ago, men now, you know? And so when you are, and we're always making these adjustments in how we behave and how we treat each other, or we are not making these adjustments and um, suffering the repercussions of that, right? So when we have, um, I think that this story and the last story in the collection, Love is Patient, Love is Kind, um, that those are the two stories in which I spent kind of like the most time with men and their choices. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the other stories are about women and friendship and, um, and also arguments. And, so, <laughs> <laughs> and like with that, I mean, there's in their own way, Ennis, and, sorry, um, Roby and Paul are struggling with their own, like, how do I do this, right? Like, how am I to be a man and move through the world, right? So Roby has found this kind of like hyper-masculinized, like pretty violent, rough path. And he, and Paul's life has been relatively placid and calm and he's done the right thing a lot of the time and um, is bored as hell. And also questioning who he really is, you know? so. I think that the interplay between like walking that fine line is sort of like what um, what happens when with these characters, and it's also what happens with all of us in our lives, right? Like, how much fun? Ask yourself, how much fun can you have tonight and not get fired? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but I want to find out. Right. <laughs> See you at eight. <laughs> um, so now you got me thinking about the first story in the collection, uh, Nature Preserve. And um, it seems to me that in that story, as well as in other stories in the collection, um, there are certain opportunities uh, for men to, um, to sort of step outside that restrictive code and offer comfort, guidance, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the things that really interests me about your treatment of the male characters in this book um, is sort of the tension that exists between what someone may know is the right thing to do even if it's in opposition with what the code is telling them to do. Uh, and so I find your male characters really convincing and, um, and compelling uh, because of the way they, they have to uh, navigate um, through their own behaviors, uh, either in opposition to or in accordance to uh, sort of this code that's, that's been a part of this place that you so beautifully uh, depict in these stories. Um, 
Would you like to say anything? There's like one thing more about your male characters before I move on. I can't remember who told me this, but one of my early readers mentioned that there's nothing more dangerous than being a llama or a man in one of my books. <laughs> 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 like something's going to happen to you or, <laughs> or you're going to make a choice. Right. And it, then, and it, I mean, this is true for all the people, right? Yeah. Cause again, yeah. I'd have no book, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it, I, I think that I'm really conscious of the times that like I have um, myself personally chosen to say something when nobody else was saying something. And I'm really conscious of the many times that I haven't said anything. And I feel a lot worse about the times that I haven't said anything or that I did not do the right thing, you know? And I think that, you know, the struggles that you come into in your own life manifest themselves in lots of different ways when you write, you know, whether you write poetry or fiction or you write memoir. Um, but I think that those are the questions of the human condition. And so I always, even if someone's not familiar with this wor world or they're like, Appa what, you know, or why are you making me read about these hillbillies, right? Like it, it's, it's important for me to tell stories in a way that the human condition and the, the, the struggles that they're encountering, no matter where they are um, or, or where people are coming from are meaningful to them because that's what I see in the books I enjoy the most. That is the victory of your stories, Jamie Lynn. It really, really <laughs> indeed. Um, even though uh, your readers may not share your intimate knowledge of this particular place, uh, we all share your intimate knowledge of the human condition. And so the struggles of your characters become all of our struggles. Uh, and the victories of your characters become all of our victories. Um, I thought we might talk a bit about um, the female characters uh, in, in the book. Um, I, was, I was interested in your take upon whether you see any sort of evolution um, in the role of uh, women in rural settings um, through your own experience or through the, the work you did on these stories. Um, for, for instance, is the 2020 woman in, in, in locales like the ones in your stories, is, is that woman different uh, than past generations? You know, a lot of the time I see, um, I see women in rural, in, in rural culture, at least the rural, rural cultures that I move in, um, in actually like a lot of positions of advocacy and power and engagement and doing a lot of cool stuff. You know, like most of our nonprofits are led by women, right. locally where I live, which is kind of amazing, right. you know. Um, so a lot of the really good, like, you know, getting people fed, making sure they've got heat in the winter, helping them connect with housing, librarians, teachers, right? Like that, a, a lot of that work is done by women. And I, I, I see some of the things in those helping professions changing, right? Um, and, and one of the things that I think is really great about being in and about being in that work myself, you know, as a teacher, um, which is mostly what I consider myself, you know, after being a writer, um, is that like I see um, some things changing and I see a lot more pushback, particularly from younger women. You know, and I also see a lot of uh, and hear a lot of us telling each other, you know, like, um, I just, uh, you know, don't tolerate that. Here's what I make. What are you making? You know, like when that guy talks to you like that, you get him written up. <laughs> like there's no reason for that to be happening uh -huh. at work. And those are not necessarily things that happened as frequently. I think they're kind of like the culture is changing as women continue to, you know, um, integrate into the workforce. But I think that you have fewer choices um, in a rural area. And a lot of what people do when they feel trapped is, um, is that's when you do crazy stuff, right? Mm. Like that's when you get your lifetime movie. That's when, <laughs> that's, when, <laughs> that's when you do the stuff that is transgressive. And transgression is also an opportunity to transform, right? Mm. So I, I, I like the way that, some of the way that I'm seeing things move. 
right? But then on the like meta cultural level, like um, he who shall not, not be named, but starts with Louis and ends with I'm a jerk, just won a Grammy for an album in which he brags about the assaults that got him in trouble to begin with, mm. right? Like, what is this, you know? And I wonder how many women didn't get their album heard, mm -hmm. right? Or mm -hmm. like, won't be heard. Um, and I wonder about why that is okay, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, I look at the kind of like um, glorification of bad behavior in celebrity culture. And I think in a, when you live in a small place and people know you and know your story intimately, know kind of predictive text to you sometimes <laughs> when, if they're reading you, you know, that's something that with women, um, I hope as we see certain movements move forward in our time, like um, I'm, I'm really hoping that women learn to raise a lot more hell, you know, um, and that if we stop, we're in a lot of trouble, particularly when it comes to free speech, when it comes to reproductive freedom, um, when it comes to autonomy and separation of church and state, right? So women can lead the way on that, or we can, you know, all lose and compromise our freedoms. So if women aren't free, nobody is free. <laughs> and that's kind of how I see the stories in this book. A, a lot of these women are looking for freedom. That, that's, a, that's a wonderful response to my question. Thank you so much for that. Um, as you know, um, I grew up in a farming family uh, in southeastern Illinois. And, you know, as I look back upon those years, all those low, those many years ago, uh, the thing that really stands out for me is that uh, women were really the people who were holding everything together. Um, whenever anything was threatening to explode, it was the women in that culture that, that held everything together. Um, so what you're saying now, as far as your uh, thoughts on the evolution of women in rural culture, um, you know, women uh, having more roles in advocacy and um, social uh, causes, et cetera, et cetera. It seems to me that this is the difference. Um, the women were always, always the advocates. Mm -hmm. Only now they're being recognized as such. Would you agree with that? I think so. I mean, and we see a lot of, um, you know, women in elected office. I mean, we're seeing mm. a lot of, you know, and this is where I get really careful with my language because like, just because a woman is in elected office doesn't mean that she's an ally or a supporter of women's rights right. or freedom or liberation, right. right? Like it's not enough to just be a thing. Yeah. <laughs> You've got to do the work. And so, um, you know, there are women that are in office right now that would just as happily take away our freedoms as any guy. So I, I don't want there to be kind of yeah. false equivalence yeah. with this, right? Yeah. What, I, what I would say is I think that with um, the way that we are looking at um, the role of men and women and also like non-binary people, which mm -hmm. is a very important thing, right? So all the stuff that's happening everywhere else in the world is also happening in Little Laurelton, is, is also happening mm -hmm. in Knox County where I live. You know, so as we begin to interrogate our identities about like, you know, what does it mean to be a good person, right? Like, what does it mean if, um, if I, how do I understand and like, appreciate the humanity um, of someone who looks, thinks, believes differently than me. Again, we're right back to that human condition right. thing, right? right? And so for me, the, the advocacy piece, um, I would rather have, um, you know, a person who is allied with liberation and freedom <laughs> on my side yeah. than a woman just because she, you know, happens yeah. to be a lady, you know? So there's, I do a certain amount of ambivalence about that, especially when I think about gender fluidity and, you know, right, and right. my own acceptance of the fact that I think that we all have the right to decide who we are and what we want to be called. So with that, like, mm -hmm. there's more freedom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think this is, this is really the importance of, of stories like the ones in township, um, you know, you're calling attention to um, parts of the population that sometimes get overlooked, in all honesty. Um, not only in our, in our culture, um, in our society, but also in the publishing world. Um, and so when stories like yours come along that um, treat 
these characters with the dignity they deserve, even if their actions are less than wise. Uh, I think that's a, that's a really important um, voice to have out there. Um, I'd like to ask you a little bit about a phrase that you use in the book. Uh, it's one that was familiar to me. I'm not sure if it's familiar to everyone. Uh, but at one point, one of your characters cautions another character not to get above her raisin. Would you like to explain what that is? Oh, yeah, that's in Homegrown, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, well, having been told that many times <laughs> myself, like, I sure know. Um, I'm looking to make sure nobody's coming through with the willow switch. Um, <laughs> like, so getting above your, getting above your raisin is like outgrowing your, and this can happen for anyone, right? Like um, it's outgrowing, it's a kind of ingratitude. It's, feeling that you have outgrown or somehow, I, I really don't like the word overcome who you are, you know, like overcome your circumstances, right? Or like, um, or that you have moved beyond and become better than the people who you grew up with, right? In your home culture, whatever that culture is, yeah. you know? And so in specifically in Appalachian culture, if you like, are getting above your raisin, then you are starting, maybe you've gone and gotten yourself an education. You now have a $70,000 truck. You've got, you know, um, you're in good shape, right? You can go to Florida whenever you want or you know, all the yeah. nice accoutrements of middle class, upper middle class, whatever wealth, right? Like you can do all these things. And then you start to look down on where you came from. Or if you make fun of it in a way that doesn't like acknowledge humanity, right? So Lee, like, you know, you can make fun of your cousins and I can make fun of your cousins, but you cannot make fun of my cousins. Right, like, I'm, <laughs> I'm never make fun of your cousins. Right, <laughs> exactly. Um, and so like with that, I think it's basically this sort of like equivalent, right? Of making fun of your own cousin, you know, <laughs> or making fun of somebody else's cousin or treating them like an outsider, right? Like you've moved beyond in some way that yeah. you don't need to acknowledge who you were before. And I think for some artists, there's a need for full reinvention, right? And to swear off the things that were before, like a religious conversion or something, and they become bad bunny, mm. you know, um, or they become whatever. Mm. And like, and that's, that's fine for that particular artist. For me, like what I wanted to talk about in my work and what I probably continue to talk about for quite a while um, are the ways that like, there's a lot more going on in these tiny towns all over the country. This is not just Ohio, you know, everybody's dealing with the same set of problems, right? Whether it's wage stagnation, <clears throat> lack of opportunity, um, whether it is um, issues with, I mean, meth, everybody's got meth, right? Like there's, you know, there's problems. The problems are the same across the country or infrastructure, whatever, you know, we've got these things that, um, but in these places where you might tend to think, oh, you know, this is all white people and corn, you know, it, there's a lot more complicated yeah. stuff happening in all of these places and a lot more lives being lived. And the other thing is that we, a lot of people in um, areas around metropolitan hubs commute in and out every single day and come here for entertainment. There's no longer the isolation that like my grandmother grew up with on a corn tobacco hog farm in Southwestern yeah. Virginia, right? Like had to sneak into the woods to go to a fiddle dance to meet boys, right? Like it, it really was, um, you know, I mean, I, I used to, I, it really is true that I did not see cable television until I went to college because like could, you couldn't get cable on the road where I grew up and just nobody had it, you know? And I like had never seen MTV, like, you know, the stuff that like most of my generation had like seen, you know, it was yeah. such a big deal in the eighties yeah. and nineties. And it like, I remember just watching it for hours in the student lounge, like totally gobsmacked. I'm like, oh my God, I have like a decade of zoning out on MTV. Like who, and it, I'd heard the music, but I hadn't seen, you know, and so that kind of isolation doesn't happen anymore because there is, thank God, a thing called the internet. So if I want to listen to somebody in Africa doing, you know, a reading, I can do that. I can tune into French hip hop. It's great. You should all listen to it. And like, you know, if, if you want to hear someone um, read or you want to go to a lecture halfway around the world, world or make a friend in Pakistan, you, you go out and do it, you know, <laughs> like that's a great thing. So the world both expands and shrinks at the same time. 
What was the question? <laughs> oh my God, I'm so sorry. I got really lost. Uh, well, above well, your raisin. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if I take all that stuff and all these really kind of cool and amazing experiences that I've had because of a lot of privileges, a lot of mentors, a lot of people helping me along the way. And I forget that like a generation ago, you know, somebody in my family was born at home. One of the first things they learned how to do was write like hitch a mule. Yeah. You know, I mean, it was like a major responsibility when you got your acre, right? And that's your acre to hoe and weed and make sure that you keep clean of, of, of weeds so that the tobacco or the cotton of the corn can grow. You know, if I forget that and I fail to acknowledge that person alongside the, the um, maybe another character who's, you know, having a, an experience like, you know, Paul is deeply closeted for his own safety in this right. story. There is no way he's coming out, right? Um, and that the loneliness of that for him, um, I think leads to a lot of his bad decisions, but he does not get above his raising because he's at home doing what he's supposed to do and taking care of his mother, yeah. you know? So there's yeah. also too, I think that pull in the expression between doing something out of love and also like obligation. But what is love if not a kind of, debt and owing each other something and and doing it both willingly and because you wouldn't be able to live with yourself if you didn't do the right thing by that person so there's i try to portray um all my characters with love even when i freaking hate them you know and that's what we have to do yeah right yeah um, like that one guy yeah. <laughs> we, we never have to we never have to condone or approve right we merely have to understand um the sources of a character's behavior uh, which leads me i believe into seeing whether we have questions or, or comments uh, i mean i could talk to you on and on about all this kind of stuff and i've got lots of other stuff i'd like to talk to you about but i want to make sure we have time sure for the audience um, whether they're uh here in person or, or zooming in to to listen to us do we have some questions or, or comments about uh, anything Thank you so much for that, Kate. I, I think that um, the journey of the book is something that I think really shows that, you know, you can compose in isolation, but you can't really write in isolation. You know, um, I had um, Lee's workshop. I mean, and if I, honestly, most of these stories were in my senior thesis at Ohio State. And so after I got um, a story in The Pinch, it's a wonderful literary magazine, and in the Kenyon Review, um, I, Aaron McGraw said, you should get an agent. And I didn't really know anything about publishing. Um, and especially literary publishing. When I went to graduate school, I, I had a huge learning curve. I just wanted time to write, you know, and, um, I, so whatever people told me to do, I just did. And you know me, like whatever I do, I'm going to do it like times way too many. And so, <laughs> and so she direct, she got me in touch with an agent. So the agent wanted to see the thesis project. So I sent them to her and my agent, Jody Kahn, who's amazing and wonderful and um, who I owe so much of this book to said, all right, well, we're going to work on these for the next few months and then we're going to send them out. Um, so some really interesting stuff happened that I hope never happens to anybody else, which is that the, about a week before my a second round of revisions was due to Jody. My house burned down. Oh, wait, it burned up. It was an attic fire. So, the, and and um, that kind of set me back a little bit. I remember calling her when the, in the morning when the house was like the fireman had left, and I was like, I'm not going to make deadline. And she was just like, Stop calling me. Will you tell me this? Like, it's fine. We'll figure it out. Like, you know, um, and it was wonderfully gracious about it and everything. And I think in a lot of ways, I, as I said, I wrote these stories from predominantly 2012 to 2015 originally. Um, but at that point, I had only, I had moved back to Ohio after like 15 years in New York and Los Angeles. And I was trying to understand what I had done and where I was as an adult, right? Moving back someplace where you grew up is really weird. And um, you're different, everybody else is different. So many things are the same. I honestly probably could have used the same phone book 
um, at least for goods and services. <laughs> um, but like with that, so I get through the draft with Jody, we send it out, it gets rejected by like 30 places. That takes a while, like a couple years. Um, and I just kept tinkering at it. And in during that time, I was lucky because I kept publishing small pieces here and there, you know, like a lot of the pieces in this have, have, have appeared um, in American Literary Review, The Boiler. Um, I, I just was really fortunate. And along the way, I started, people started asking me to read for literary magazines and for contests. And that was really when I started to understand how to edit my work. And so if you are a writer and you want to learn how to write, go read for a magazine or go read for a contest and look at what's happening out there and what people are doing. And when you're sitting there being like, oh my gosh, this is beautiful. You're weeping. You're so happy. Like I want people to have that feeling, but I also would read stuff and I'd be like, oh shit, this makes me want to put my own eyes out. Right. And like, I just did that in my story and now I have to go die and do a rewrite. So like, so I would see these things and I, I don't in any way mean to disparage another writer. I really want the target of this to be me, <laughs> you know, like, but there are times when you see a writer make a move and you're just like, oh man. Um, and so like with all of that, I, I had to really grow and I had to really grow as a reader. And I knew the stories I wanted to tell, but I wasn't, I think in some ways ready to tell them fully when the book first started its long journey. Then, and this is another thing writers should do, go to AWP, I went to the, I went to the conference. I was wandering around trying to promote a literary magazine I had started and I tripped over something and landed literally like on a, table that I managed to not knock over and righted myself but it was one of those like super awkward things and I was like oh what is cornerstone press and the guy is laughing and I was like I'm sorry I'm awkward I break things all the time and I you know trip and can't walk and so <laughs> so we started talking and I was like oh well, you have this undergrad program I'm working in an undergrad program let's talk about stuff and um he was like well we publish he was telling me about the press and he was like send me something so I go back from AWP, lose his card, couldn't find it. And I was going through a folder and it had fallen into a different thing. And I was like, man, I think that's like the last, one of the like three places I have not queried. And so on my birthday in 2019, I think it was, I, I was like, all right, you're gonna get this stuff sent out before your birthday. So March 1st, um, Brian Taco Baker's birthday, I sent out the queries <laughs> and by my birthday, which is March 5th, I'd heard back from Cornerstone and I had two rejections from the other places, which it's fine. I've had to reject stuff too. And it, it's heartbreaking. So it was neat. I was like, okay. So they took it and I was really surprised because I just had kind of done like a Hail Mary thing. You know, I thought, well, maybe this is just, this book is something where it was something for me to learn about myself as a writer, but no, you know, just certain stories and it won't see the light of day. The first book will be this novel I'm working on. I'd kind of like given up, you know, and I just um, want to tell writers like, don't, don't do that. Someone, if you keep working on it, right. And also in this process too, I've, I've been remiss. Aaron freaking McGraw, read so many drafts and so many like, hey, I tried this other thing <laughs> and was so gracious and has been such a wonderful supporter and has been like, oh girl, don't do that. And this is working, you know, that I, I really owe a great debt. So having this community of people around me, whether it's Lee, my agent, my, you know, um, Aaron, my friends who have read things, but I'm like, can I get away with this? Is, is really like what kept me going, you know, and what made it possible for me to get to that point. But I just would say like, use that, um, use that time and use, the re use your rejections wisely. There were things that were not working that I had to learn how to fix. So being willing to do that, I think was the only reason that we wound up with this. And I really want to thank Cornerstone Press for letting me fall on their table and talk to me anyway. <laughs> Ross Tangadol has been great. <laughs> I'm really so, happy you fell on that I, It was meant to be, but it's like a meat cute for books. And I, I was just like, yeah. yeah Anyone great. who's ever seen me try to navigate a room with tables in it knows this is... <laughs> Not safe. We'll, we'll make a wide <laughs> eye when you exit. Right. I smacked you when I tried to hug you. Today. I, I thought I dislocated his wrist. <laughs>
We won't even talk too about too much enthusiasm. We won't even talk about <laughs> hot, hot pads left on burning stoves. Oh yeah, I set my dress on fire before. What was the epilogue? Event? Wasn't yeah, it? epilogue, and I had to change. <laughs> uh, other, <laughs> other questions or comments? are magic and I love them and I think that very often we forget how much we interact with the natural world right and like there's something really amazing about the fact that we can communicate with other species and that they they tolerate us the way that they do you know and growing up in the country I mean there were like there's actually like a lot of um I have a lot of wonderful memories about our pets and things like that. And I have a lot of really sad memories about livestock or strays or, you know, animals that were hoarded, you know, um, which is very common where I live. Um, and I, I just have a great heart for them. And I, I think that when you have, um, when you have the opportunity to like, um, interact with another species, you know what I mean? And to really have, we forget about our relationships with those as being so important, whether you eat them or not, <laughs> you know, like it's, um, but it, it's also very complicated, you know? And so, so when I moved back from New York, I decided that I was going to raise my own food. So I had all these chickens and I have a very horrible essay about chickens and how they're truly terrible animals, but, um, <sighs> They like, uh, I got ringworm, like <laughs> from the chickens, it was awful. But I also like, you know, I was raising them for eggs and then um, some of them inevitably like would wind up being meat. And so, you know, the first year I named them all after female country music stars. And boy, was that a mistake because who wants to go butcher Emmy Lou Harris, right? <laughs> or like, you know, that was dumb. Like, <laughs> And I had to like, I had to actually have my sister help me because I was so upset about the whole thing. And my dad made fun of me and it was, you know, but it was really like, I learned, I had to learn, like, if I'm really going to raise my own food, I had to put a separation there. And ultimately like, yeah, I don't like chickens. I never want them at my house again, but it like, but I also like, don't, um, I learned so much from that time, right? Like about like, what am I willing to do to eat? food, right? Like, what am I, how much work it is if you really think that you're going to raise all your food and can all your food or dry it or whatever. Um, I mean, I was doing, I was like living the life, right? So the animals, um, the moving back from like a major metropolitan area to a place where it was like, I don't know, 12 miles round trip to get an avocado, you know, like that was all part of it. But I also wanted the animals to your point to be kind of like herd in a way, because I really don't hate llamas. Like, um, but, and, but I had also been really sort of curious about these llama farms that were all over the place. And like, how the heck do you farm a llama, right? Like, like what happens, what are they capable of? And um, so some of the stuff that I found out about was just really great content that you can't make up, right? Like, did you know that llamas will butt smother coyotes until you read this book? Like, that's how they, they're used to guard sheep. They, the llamas, they get them and they, they'll they sit on the coyotes and smother them with their butts. And that is how they kill the coyote. And like, I really, I don't like coyotes either, but there are animals I like. I will talk about them in a moment. But the, <laughs> the thing is that like, I mean, like, that's amazing. You see this thing that looks like it couldn't, you know, it looks like a giant stuffed animal, but it can kill a coyote. Like, I can't do that. So, <laughs> so, you know, there's like this whole like balance in the world that I think we sometimes forget about because we interact with domesticated animals and pets all the time. And being in, in, um, proximity it again to the kind of wildness that I was totally oblivious to as a child who grew up in that environment was something that I wanted to think about and interrogate, you know. Um, and so I hope that that answers your questions. And to wit, I love elephants, dogs, peacocks, cats, and fish. <laughs> <laughs> and a bunch of other stuff too.
we should probably um, make a last call for questions or, or comments um, if anyone has any, uh, or if anyone online has, has posed a question. Um, I was just saying, my husband's online. Is he writing weird stuff in the chat? <laughs> Hi, honey. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on another book and sometimes I forget people's names. Um, I really struggled with Jean in Love is Patient, Love is Kind. I mean, it was like a story I really didn't want to write, you know, and that like, um, this is a, a character who is um, like abused children and served time in prison and comes back and had a, has had a a conversion to Christianity and wants everybody to just be okay with him. And it's a long, hard road, you know, like what is redemption, right? So Jean was one that I really didn't like. I am not crazy sometimes about um, Deborah, but I, I had to give her a story because she was just so like this character just kind of kept coming up in my mind. And um, Wayne, yeah. I could have been nicer to Wayne. <laughs> Does that <laughs> cover the? <laughs> Can so, I say some thank yous before we end? Yeah, I didn't mean uh, to cut you off. Uh, I'm really sorry. No, I was I was just getting oh. ready to say, um, what have I not asked you? Oh. And so now, if you'd like to say whatever you want to say, please Anything? go ahead. Anything. <laughs> What I really want to say is thank you to so many people that are here because um, there are some really incredible people here tonight. Um, Erica Hardesty took my cover photo as an amazing photographer. She is here. Um, Kara Eccles designed the book cover. Um, all of the beauty that you see. Lee Martin, of course, like helped with all this. And he truly spared you so much. He kept me from taking so many bad ideas and making them worse. It was amazing. And like Aaron too. I mean, the two of you were like a little, don't let her do that. <laughs> or we're like, we're not holding your beer. <laughs> um, and of course, um, you know, Aaron midwife the book and um, my friends from Break Bread Literacy Project, like Sean is here, Charlie Eskew, um, all of my friends from OSU and Whitney, who I randomly called on the phone. And I was like, hey, I have a library question, but I also have this book out. And do you want to do something? And I think it'll be fun. So I really hope that it has been fun. that <laughs> You've had a good time tonight and um, that you will go out and, um, you know, if you liked this book, there are even better books out there that other people have written. And I want you to go to those electric literature lists. And if you don't buy them, request them at your library, right? Check them out, tell people about them. Because I wrote about a complicated world, but I just know a very little bit about, you know, things that I've, I've witnessed and experienced. And I, I really do also think that we're in a community when we read a book, right? And so we're, you're, you're in a community that goes across time and space. And like, I, I have no comprehension of physics. Like I will sound really dumb if I attend, attempt to talk about them, but this is, you know, we're all time traveling together. And I love the way that literature lets us do that. And I really thank all of you for being here tonight to time travel with us. As you, as you can tell, the stories in this book are just like the lady who wrote them. <laughs> They are wickedly funny. We didn't even get a chance to talk about that, but they are wickedly funny. They are so profound. They are so evocative of a place and a people, and they are so important. And it has been my true honor to be able to converse with you tonight about this beautiful book, which is for sale across the street at Gramercy Books. Thank you so much, Jamie Lynn, for these stories and for your, your wonderful conversation this evening. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you, Lee. You bet. Thank you all for coming. Thanks, everybody.